Hello, everybody. So welcome to our October Grand Rounds. Uh, this month we have Dr. Rima Strassman. Uh, Dr. Strassman is a pediatrician and breastfeeding medicine specialist. She's been practicing pediatrics since 1995 and working with breastfeeding mothers and their babies since 1997. Uh, she became a member of the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine in 1999 and a fellow of the organization in 2009. Dr. Strassman has been the chair of ABM's fellowship committee since 2011 and joined the board of directors in 2019. She's the medical director of lactation services at St. Luke's University Health Network in Bethlehem. And uh, Dr. Strassman sees mothers and babies in the clinical setting. She supervises lactation consultants within her hospital and health network and teaches medical professions, professionals internationally about lactation and breastfeeding medicine. Um, and her presentation today is on tongue tie, evaluating for decreased function. Uh, I will just remind everybody to make sure that they are um, signed in on Teams. Uh, if you're calling in, uh, make sure you either uh, also sign in with uh, through Teams or email me that you uh, are were on, uh, and we'll get a, a transcript of who uh, was on so we can register you appropriately. Uh, do make sure after the uh, session is complete to complete the quiz and the course evaluation. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Strassman. Good afternoon, everybody. So <clears throat> we're going to review the um, functional impact of restricted tongue movement on breastfeeding. And this is our designation statement. I'm not going to go through it all for you guys. We have no financial um, relationships to disclose. And here are our um, learning objectives. Um, we're going to really focus on the clinical signs and symptoms and ramifications of tongue tie. Um, describe why evaluating is an important part of a breastfeeding exam and um, evaluate why uh, restricted tongue movement may um, impact tongue function. So this is the definition of a tongue tie. It's the presence of a sublingual frenulum with decreased length that lacks elasticity or inappropriate attachment that's too close on the gingival, on the tongue or on the gingival ridge. Um, and so it can be anatomical or anatomic or functional. So from the anatomical standpoint, it's just the presence of the tissue. This is something that's really easy to see. Um, I describe it to the families when I see them in the office. This is the one that waves the red flag and says, hello, here I am, it cannot be missed. Um, these, I get referrals for these very frequently from um, pediatricians who see them in the office without any difficulty. Babies could be breastfed, bottle fed. Um, it doesn't actually make much of a difference. The functional ones um, are when we have abnormal tongue function. There's decreased anterior extension. Babies can't stick their tongue out. They're not lifting their tongue when they cry. Um, they're not able to move their tongue from side to side in their mouth, or they um, are not able to get a good cup of the breast or um, the bottle, um, and they don't have good appropriate peristalsis of, their, um, of the tongue to be able to milk um, or pull the milk out of the breast or the bottle. There have been multiple articles that have looked at what the definition is for diagnosis or have tried to define it for use of um, their study, and they are there is no lack there is no um, full agreement on what the definition is. That also leads to having a lack of high quality evidence based longitudinal or randomized controlled studies for tongue tie or for intervention for tongue tie. Um, there's studies that suggest a prevalence of two to four um, percent. I will point out, however, that there's an organization, um, the, Inter the International Association of Tongue Tie Professionals or IATP, where they quote that there's a, a 50 percent incidence of tongue tie. Um, there's also varying infant incidents on the prevalence of tongue to of breastfeeding problems. Um, among all infants, there's quoted 3%, 9%, 
there's much higher rate in, in babies who are tongue-tied with approximately 25%. And the data does suggest that phrenotomies, phrenotomies will improve breastfeeding problems for 80 to 90% of the dyads. And I will stress that that's the dyads. Sometimes it's the mother, sometimes it's the baby who gets the imp improvement. So microanatomy studies show that there's no histologically de discrete structure. This is just a fold of the tissue that's composed typically of just oral mucosa, although it may contain fascia or the genovosus muscle. And it places tension on the floor of the mouth. And I think the fact that it places tension on the floor of the mouth is super important. I will often tell families that it's not just that the tongue is attached to the floor of the mouth, but that the floor of the mouth is attached to the tongue. So some of these babies will just have difficulty getting a wide open mouth. So here's a couple of pictures. Um, on the first one here, we can see that not only does the baby's tongue not lift, but the baby's mouth is not as open wide with crying as we will often see. And you can see even tension on the baby's lips. A couple of other pictures, and again, um, on the um, left, the same thing, the tongue doesn't lift or only the edges lift but the baby's mouth does not open wide. And this is with somebody helping to open that baby's mouth. And some additional examples of what a tongue tie can look like. And we can again see that these are, all of these were very easy to pick up. These are very clear anatomic tongue ties, but we can see how they affect the function of the tongue with decreased lift or modification of how the baby's tongue moves when they look cry. So with restricted movement, there is a functional impediment to effective latch, um, effective suck and or milk transfer. Um, and there's often subjective complaints on the part of the mother with pain, difficulty latching, poor breast drainage. Um, they often will complain that there's prolonged feeding durations. Um, I've had women complain that the baby is on and off the breast, on and off the breast, never seems like they're settling in for a good feeding. And very often the baby always seems hungry, nursing very frequently. For objective findings, there can is often nipple damage. Um, it can be uh, in the way form of um, cracks and bleeding, which is never normal, um, or just compression of the nipple when the baby comes off. There can be milk stasis, um, with milk stasis, meaning the baby's not emptying the breast well, that can lead to suboptimal weight, infant weight gain. Um, this can also lead to blocked ducts and ultimately mastitis. Um, with these issues, ankyloglossia is only part of the differential. We can have other issues as demonstrated by my cartoon here. What are some of the other risks for tongue tie or ankyloglossia? So speech difficulties are certainly a possibility, other feeding issues, um, dental problems, um, including orthodontic or mandibular abnormalities, the high, a high arched palate, dental hygiene. We all know that we get our tongue up behind our back teeth to try and clean out any large debris that we can feel back there. Um, there is not strong data on the benefit of doing phrenotomy, certainly in the infant time frame, to deal with these issues. Um, there was a study done by Ballard um, et al. that was published in Pediatrics in 2002. Um, they looked at um, 20... 2,763 newborns and um, an additional newborns in the nursing clinic and found that um, there was an incidence of approximately 3.2% of tongue tie, but there was 12.8% in those who sought breastfeeding help. Um, phrenotomy was offered to all the tongue tie infants who presented with latch issues using a, the Hazel Baker um, method of evaluation for tongue tie, which I'll show you in a little while. Zero percent, zero of these babies had any complication and that 100% um, had objective improvement based again on the Hazel Baker evaluation. So the evidence regarding breastfeeding and tongue tie strongly suggests that it is a safe procedure with minimal risk and that it does improve breastfeeding. So this is from that same study pre phrenotomy pain levels were quite high, whereas post phrenotomy the, the pain levels had very had significantly dropped. 
So when we do a Google search, not sorry, not a Google search, a, a PubMed search for evidence regarding speech and tongue tie, there's actually very little evidence. There's lots of theory and anecdotes. Um, certainly if we make sounds and we talk, we know that it's important to get our tongue through of our mouth to make L's and N sounds, many of the TH and T sounds. Um, one of my favorites is talking about the, the trilled R or rolled R sound. I had a family that I worked with, and I mentioned this very frequently when I talked to my patients, who um, the father side of the family was from Puerto Rico, and I was explaining to them that um, this limited data, um, but was talking about the impact of not being able to get the tongue to the roof of the mouth. And I commented that their son, um, since they did speak Spanish in the household, might sound more like he studied, Sp um, studied Spanish in our American school system and um, the father laughed at me and said well that's what his brother sounded like because he had also been tongue-tied so um, in this one study um, Baxter et al followed 37 children um, from the ages of 13 months to 12 years um, the mean age was about four four and a half four and a quarter years and they paired phrenotomy with exercises um, and they followed them up one week and one month after the study was, after the phrenotomy was done. They used parental reports for all of the data and they had 89% reported improved speech and 50% reported new word acquisition. My, um, I would point out, however, that we're looking at children that were mostly in the 4.4 year range. Um, some of them were quite younger, and this is an age group where we would see a lot of improved speech and new word acquisition anyway. So it may or may not have anything to do with the phrenotomy. In a systemic review um, published in 2020 that reviewed 35 studies, there was only one that concluded anything regarding improved speech. Um, and that and it came from one uh, randomized controlled study, but there was a high degree of bias uh, in this study. Um, my favorite study to quote to our families um, regarding this is a, a good study, although it was very small, that came out of Israel. Um, this is the published study that I've seen. I have a friend in Israel who told me that she has repeated the study with a larger group, but I have not been able to find the published data on it. Um, they looked at children between the ages of four and eight. There were about eight children in each group um, in this study, which I'll show the data of in just a second. Um, so there were about eight children who had phrenotomy as infants for breastfeeding related problems and eight children who were who were controls who were not tongue tied. And there were an additional eight children who were, if you will, another group of controls who were tongue tied and had no information, had no intervention. Um, there were some increased articulation errors in those who'd undergone tongue tie, who'd undergone the phrenotomies compared to those who had not, but there was no significant impact on overall intelligibility and no difference between those who had phrenotomies and those who did not. So this is the um, chart that reviews those who were treated and those who did not have tongue tie. And I specifically want you to look at the p-values. There's nothing there that's significant. And the same is true when we go ahead and we look at the um, group who were, had untreated tongue tie versus those that had the phrenotomies. Now, again, the numbers are very small, so there is um, issues with the size of the study, so there needs still to be further study done on this. So history of tongue tie. There's actually historical references to surgery being done for tongue tie going back 10,000 years, and there's information in the Greek medical reference, Greek medical studies um, on references to operative interventions. Midwives, when they would go from house to house and deliver babies, um, used to keep one pinky fingernail long and when they would smack the baby on the bottom and make the baby cry, if the tongue didn't lift and there was a visible frenulum, would take that long sharpened pinky fingernail and slice through the frenulum. However, as bottle feeding increased, concerns about the impact decreased. Um, and I, uh, 30 years ago or so when I was in residency, we were taught, oh, look, this baby's tongue tied. Isn't that interesting? But if this children, child has issues with speech, we can always send them to an ear, nose and throat doctor when they get older. We don't need to worry about it now. It doesn't mean anything. 
But as breastfeeding increased, more there was more awareness. The lactation consultants became more aware that this caused an issue, and that led to more interest in doing the procedure. Um, I will. Pediatricians jumped on board right away. We don't in general do a whole lot of procedures and this one's quick and simple and easy and we can do it right in the office. Um, becomes revenue generating, so we jumped on that right away. Um, but that meant that other providers as well jumped on it and so it became a really big, you know, it's kind of the in procedure to do now and everybody with a laser or a pair of scissors in their office may wanna be interested in doing so. Um, but now we have some evidence-based studies that show some limited risk and early benefit to decrease pain. As I mentioned before, we do need more randomized controlled studies um, to help us know that this is worth doing. There are several tools that exist for evaluating, and I'm going to go over a couple of them in just a minute, but none of them are fully val validated. So they vary in complexity and inter-rater of reliability. That means that somebody might find that this baby's truly has restricted tongue movement and another person may find that it's not as as um, as obvious. So we can't rely on the tools by themselves to determine the need for a phrenotomy. Evaluation needs to include um, looking at mom, getting a full history and physical exam, evaluating for nipple damage or poor breast drainage. The history, um, the exam is important because if mom's got clear nipple damage or breast um, issues with blocked ducts or mastitis, it's super important, but the history is almost more important. Very often by the time I'm seeing them, the mothers are already starting to heal and so I may not see the nipple damage. For the infant evaluation, we need to make sure that there isn't some other issue going on, some other reason why the baby's not having issues with damage, uh, with poor weight gain or something along those lines. But that detailed oral exam is very important, and that's what I'll be going through later on in the in our talk. Um, and then direct observation of a feeding is essential. So this is the Hazel Baker tool. Um, there's actually a nice little um, box that can be used for um, or chart that can be used where um, the person using it, the rater can use the box and say, okay, I'm seeing zero, one, and then add up all the scores to get a score. And then looking at the scores um, and saying um, the infant's tongue, um, so at the bottom it says here, the infant's tongue was assessed using the five appearance and the seven functions and the signal, and then when you get a score of this or a score of that, then you're looking at more likely to have um, a tongue tie. The Bristol Tongue Assessment Tool, or BTAT, um, is another one. It's um, a little easier to score. There's not as many things to look at. Um, and it's going to look more here at anatomy necessarily than function, because we're not looking as well at how the baby is sucking at the breast or sucking at a finger. When I do my evaluation, I always listen to the heart and lungs um, and check the belly. I want to make sure, especially if I'm seeing a baby for any concerns regarding weight gain, that there isn't some systemic issue, um, such as a murmur or enlarged spleen or liver or something else that might be a major issue for why this baby's not gaining weight. Um, I will also check for torticollis. Um, it's especially important if a the nursing parent is describing more damage or more pain on one side versus the other. Um, I will watch the baby cry, although I don't go out of my way to make the baby cry. Um, they're usually unhappy and hungry, so it's very easy to see what's going on and to see how well the baby is, the baby's tongue is lifting. Um, I then look to see how well the baby lateralizes, the tongue lateralizes, and if the tongue will extend to reach for my finger. I will sweep my finger underneath the tongue. I'm looking to see if I wasn't able to easily see the frenulum, what it feels like. Um, we, I refer to this as the speed bump and see if my finger kind of gets caught up on the frenulum. Certainly, if I stick my finger far enough under anybody's tongue, I will feel a frenulum. We all have one, um, so it's not about how far do I have to stick my finger under to get that speed bump, but how easy is it to feel. Um, I will assess the palate, um, looking to see if the baby has a high arched palate. Um, soft tissue is stronger than bony tissue, so if the tongue is not fitting up into the palate and help broadening it out, then the soft tissues of the nose will be more likely to pull it up and the baby may have a more high arched palate from in utero development. 
Um, I will check to see how the baby's tongue cups my finger. Does it do so while staying out over the bottom gum ridge? Do we have appropriate peristalsis and wave motion of the tongue? Is it only partially in the back? Am I getting that snap back where the back of the tongue is flicking at the tip of my finger? Or is that where all of the peristalsis is occurring, causing my finger to be squeezed against the palate? And how much is the baby pulling in and pursing their lips and around their lips or their cheeks to suck on my finger? And then I will usually uh, do, I visualize the uh, frenulum. Um, while I'm not looking specifically at the anatomy, I do want to see what the anatomy, what the anatomy shows me to explain this decreased function. So I will turn the baby away so that their top of their head is next to my body and their feet are away from me, slide my fingers up underneath the tongue and lift the tongue to see what I'm able to see and use that to help me explain um, what I'm seeing with the function. So this is a video. Um, I'm going to play the video and talk you through what I'm doing as I'm examining this baby. And then I have a couple of stills from this video where I will show you again what I'm looking at. So the baby's crying and I'm looking at the tongue and it's not lifting necessarily as well as I would like to see it lift. I'm giving the baby a chance to suck on my finger and I can feel the palate. I can also see that the baby's tongue doesn't come out as far as I would like, and it's not coming out over the lip. I'm trying to get to see if I can get the baby to open a little bit more. And then I can really see and feel the palate this way. Again, trying to encourage the baby to suck. I'm struggling a little bit holding the camera as well. I think I'm gonna hand the camera off to a student or an assistant, and then I'm gonna get my thumb underneath. So by pulling the jaw down, I can mimic more when the baby's mouth is open a little wider and you can see how the baby's tongue comes out, but then pulls immediately back behind the gum ridge. So that baby is doing more biting as the baby sucks and that's going to cause discomfort. At this point, I will often look at a mom and say, do you feel like the baby's biting you? And which point in time I often get a very surprised, yeah, how did you know? So this is, these are stills from the picture. The first one on the left, um, my finger is in the baby's mouth on the right, uh, sorry, on the baby's, on the baby's right. Um, in the second one, my finger is in the mouth on the baby's left, and I am touching um, the tongue, and you can see that the baby's finger is not following my tongue, but following my finger to, to lateralize. And um, in the last picture, all the way to the right, you can see this baby's palate and how high and arched this baby's palate is. So this is our second video. This baby, again, not, not moving to follow my finger. You can actually see that little dimpling in this baby's tongue. It's almost that little heart shape. I'm going to sweep my finger under this baby's tongue and I'm going to feel the palate. This baby's tongue definitely doesn't lift as he cries. Trying again to get him to lateralize just in case he wasn't cooperative because he's hungry and he won't do anything. But you can see that the median wrath becomes very prominent. One of those other things that I will look for as I do the evaluation. And there's the frenula. I get my fingers in and I can see it very prominent. And then again, his cupping is better, but he still also pulls his tongue back a little bit as he sucks. So again, we got a little bit more lateralization from this baby than we got from the other one, but you can almost see in this side here that the uh, right side of his tongue is pulling up as he tries to lateralize. And then again, you can see me pulling up his tongue and you can see how tight it is and that we don't get good stretch when I lift his tongue passively. So these babies should be seen by somebody skilled to do a good breastfeeding evaluation and determine what else is going on when um, the history and physical examination are concerning. 
Um, when there's concerns of other variations um, or there's unexplained nipple pain, if everything is looking well, so you're not seeing anything else going on, there's not an obvious frenulum, but there's poor weight gain. Um, and um, to refer to a breastfeeding medicine physician or other physician who does phrenotomies, when a lactation consult consultation or speech or lactation speech or physical therapy does not help, um, I. I'm a little um, biased here, and I think that these evaluations should be done um, by a breastfeeding medicine provider because when they see an ear, nose, and throat provider, they see um, plastic surgery. Our plastic surgeons won't do this until they're six months of age or older, in which point in time we're kind of behind the eight ball for breastfeeding. But when they see the ear, nose, and throat doctor, they see the dentist, they do not put the baby immediately to the breast afterward, and they're not doing this full breastfeeding evaluation, which is certainly super important. So there's a, certainly non-surgical management. Um, many of these babies will outgrow the limitations. Um, they can have um, time with skilled lactation or speech therapy, um, working with how they suck, um, how they move their tongue, working on improved tongue movement, even physical therapy, although I didn't mention it here on my slide. Um, I've had babies who have some torticollis and you work on the torticollis and their tongue movement improves significantly. Um, shared decision making is essential. This is a um, medically beneficial, not a medically necessary procedure. And while the risk is minimal, it's still surgery. And so it still does include risk. So I would never try to talk somebody into having this done um, just because we can do it. Um, and I think the most important thing is that the presence of a tight lingual frenulum alone is not an indication for a phrenotomy. Um, back in February, I saw two babies back to back. Both of them had pretty signet, pretty similar evaluations, and both of them had frenulums that came all the way to the very tip of the tongue and right up to the very bottom of the frenul of the uh, lower alveolar ridge. Both babies had good lateralization. They both were able to cup my finger very well. They both had good peristalsis. Um, both babies were gaining weight beautifully. Neither mom, mother had ever had any damage to the nipple, and both babies' latches looked great at the breast. But one baby would latch on, come off, latch on, come off, latch on, come off, latch on, come off, and never really seemed to settle in for the feeding. The other baby was doing fine. So the baby that was doing fine, I talked to them about what long-term issues with breastfeeding might look like so that if the baby does slow down on weight gain, seems to start to become not as satisfied, start showing signs of decreased weight gain or excuse me, um, not being satisfied at the breast or mom's concern that her milk production is decreasing, that those would be reasons that we would need to see them back. The, uh, the baby who was on and off the breast all the time, that baby we took care of getting consent for and did the phrenotomy right away. Um, I do have a bunch of references in my next couple of slides, but does anybody have any questions for me? Is there anything in the chat? Please feel free to turn on your mic and speak if you'd like. If you have any questions or type into the chat, please. So I have a, a procedural question. Yep. If we uh, if we're evaluating an infant um, or a mother who was uh, mentioning about this, how um, is is there an ambulatory order that we can place there, or? There isn't an ambulatory order yet. I think we're working on it, but you can just have them call or okay. call baby and me for them okay. and Tara can help them get scheduled. Okay, excellent. Yep. And do they need to uh, run that through their PCP or is that just insurance dependent? It's insurance dependent, okay. yeah. Oh, here's one. Um, what is your recommendation for older kids age two to five who are coming in for speech therapy? Um, so it depends on how they're progressing. Um, there isn't a lot of, I've spent a lot of time looking for the data on the need to do phrenotomies for speech issues. And there's lots of case reports, but there's no good randomized control or any other kind of study to indicate the need to do this for speech. 
So if they're not progressing um, and there's a concern that they do need release, we've got excellent ear, nose and throat doctors who would do the procedure. Thank you. Yeah. She said, thank you. Too. <laughs> <laughs> what other questions do you guys have? So I will tell you that um, even though the indication is clearly for breastfeeding, when I see babies, I've seen babies who are truly struggling at a bottle, can't get a good seal on the bottle, just bite at the bottle, their tongue restriction is so significant. Um, so I have done the phrenotomy on infants who can't feed at a bottle. Um, and when they babies have that sort of standard classic, if you will, frenulum, um, and families are concerned about what it means for speech later on, I do it then too. I don't refuse just because, because again, it's shared decision making. Absolutely. I just don't do over six months of age. Okay. <laughs> and I know uh, we were talking about this prior to you starting uh, for uh, some of my patients with TM issues that notice more of a functional, as you termed it, more of a functional tongue tie. Uh, usually if it's a structural, it hopefully would have been taken care of earlier, but occasionally there are some, um, but with that functional tongue tie, I don't usually uh, have them fall on my finger right. but because I can verbalize and you, talk. Wait, you're the older adults, you can say, yeah. can you turn your tongue to move your tongue, tongue from side to side, right? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it definitely can be an issue with jaw issues later on. Yeah. So we see in the infant time frame, if we see that they're tight in here, we're addressing all of that. And we send through baby and me, we work really, really closely and we send a lot of our kids to speech and mm -hmm. PT routinely. Um, I joke all the time and you guys probably all know this, that within the pediatrics de department, I write more speech and physical therapy orders than anybody else because Tara, because Heidi and Christy can't actually write them. So they put the order in and my name goes on them. Um, and so I'm signing all of them. And then if you guys need um, renewals for them, they come to me and um, I just sign them because if you send them back to their primary care provider, pediatrician, whether they're in network or not, they're like, I didn't write it. I don't know what it's for. So I'm just signing them. So, you know, Excellent. so, <laughs> yep. So. Well, thanks. Uh, is there an exercise program you would recommend uh, following the release to prevent reattachment? There's no good data on doing any of those, and I do not recommend any exercises. So the science doesn't support it. Um, there was one article, and I don't have the reference for it, that came out within the past year that indicated no benefit. Didn't look at risk, but did look for benefit, didn't find any. Um, I can quote four or five other physicians who do phrenotomies as well as myself, whose experience has been the more we recommend exercises, the more likely we are to need to go back and do a revision because of, of adhesions. Um, and my theory is mucous membranes are sticky to begin with, and the more we manipulate them and play with them, the more inflammation, the stickier they get. And so the more likely they are to re-adhere. Um, the majority of physicians I find who tend to recommend doing the exercises are tend to be people who have done laser therapy, which gives you a lot more inflammatory response than the scissors do to begin with. So I don't, there's no studies on that, but that's my suspicion. That's my theory. So the biggest thing is making sure that breastfeeding occurs right afterwards. Yep. And continues. Yep. Yeah. Or, or vomit. Right. Whatever. Exactly. Yep. So I, do them right in the room. I, you know, if the parents really want to leave, I'll let them. But if they're breastfeeding, I, they're not close enough to watch what I'm doing, and I put the baby to the breast immediately following the procedure. All right. Thank you. My pleasure. If you guys have any further questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, and, and I'm available by email and tiger te tiger text. Awesome. Well, thank you very very much My for pleasure. doing this. Um, and for those of you who are watching the recorded version of this. Uh, just make sure that you complete the quiz. And for those of you watching the live one, make sure you complete the quiz. And uh, for both, make sure you complete the course evaluation. Thank you very much.